Dragon Shocking Pass revealed, his godly devil fruit, the fate of Ginny and Kuma, Luffy's mother, and more will be addressed in this one. So make sure to stay tuned for this epic chapter. Chill the Pirate King within and smash that like button if you enjoy seeing these chapter reviews and want to keep them coming. Make this the video you joined the Nakama if you haven't already by subscribing and hitting that notification bell to turn on all notifications with just one click of a button. You can help us reach our insane goal of 2 million subscribers here on YouTube, and I would be eternally grateful for that. And now, without further ado, let's jump into this chapter called Ginny, spoilers and all. We pick up again with Ginny and Kuma, who had escaped the Sorbet Kingdom and were crying from the happiness of their simple lives, which they could fully appreciate because they've been through so much. Here we have 8 years after the God Valley incident, 30 years ago from the present, and yes, this is unfortunate because we are not getting to see a much desired continuation of the God Valley flashback. I think we will get to see what happened next at some point, but at this point, it was more like a tease, but it was made clear that we were following Kuma from the beginning, and since he's not there anymore, the story has just followed him. So 8 years after the most epic of historical events, Kuma is now 17 years old and has become a pastor. He is healing the poor elderly in the country by removing the pain from their bodies using his devil fruit powers. The people call it the miracle hand. We saw something similar when he did it with Luffy and Zoro took the pain. We'll come back to that, but for now, we also see Ginny, now 21 years old, and she is looking good, it must be said. She still has a similar personality and scolds the elders camping inside the church, and seems to be very popular among the boys, we're told. Not surprising. The citizens say that the new king of the Sorbet Kingdom, King Bekori, is a heartless and cheapskate king. He even makes the sick pay tribute. The king is listening to their conversation through a snail wiretap and blushing. A classic example of a bad king and a human that stands in stark contrast to Kuma and Kuma's good heart. Kuma says to the people that he can heal them every week as long as it's just a slight sickness or pain. We see after the people leave the church that Kuma is waving them off with a smile on his face. Then we see the giant bubble of pain he pushed out of the elders, like the one Zoro took for Luffy. And that part makes a lot more sense now. Kuma takes this pain in, and he's been taking in that pain to make people feel better. He wasn't being unnecessarily cruel when he made Zoro take the pain in as we'll get into shortly. Ginny is crying and says Kuma does this every week and the people don't know that he's suffering to cure them. Kuma though, being the amazing pastor he is, says it can't be helped because someone should take all the pain and suffering that was removed or it won't disappear. If he leaves the pain alone, it will eventually go back to whoever he removed it from. Kuma says he's happy because everyone he helped was happy. So as I mentioned in retrospect, this shines new light on when he got Zoro to take in his captain's pain. The fact is, if he didn't, it would have gone back to Luffy, and furthermore, at 17, he was taking pain in every week, so he probably felt like Zoro could handle it. Very cool that Oda circled back to this fan-favorite moment where, quote-unquote, nothing happened, and added even more context to it for us. Jenny doesn't like it, but she always helps take care of Kuma after he suffers the pain. And despite the pain, they are still living in happiness after all these years together. So then we jump into 25 years ago, and Kuma is 22, and Jenny is 26. Jenny is getting older and thus pressuring Kuma to marry her now. Kuma refuses though. Ginny is furious and still pressures him, but we can understand his thinking. He obviously loves her and wants them to be happy, but he fears that what happened to his dad and mom will happen to them and specifically to Ginny. He wants to keep her safe and marrying her is putting her life in danger, not to mention the life of their future children. Now the chapter starts really getting hype because when he changes the subject, Kuma changes the subject to Dragon, whose untattooed face is in the newspaper. It's news about Dragon and the Freedom Army as it's called right now. Kuma Kuma says Dragon is cool and must be a hero. Kuma says he wants to go out to the sea someday and save many people. That's the way he wanted to live his life. We get a funny throwback to the chapter before and those two kids who bullied Kuma are adults now. They bring fish to Kuma and Ginny. And it's clear that they both have a crush on Ginny. But the question is, will Dragon have a crush on her too? Because as we're about to see, both Kuma and her will join the Revolutionary Army. So now we jump into 22 years ago, where a big incident happened. Now Kuma has his trademark hat, and he can no longer be the gentle giant. You can see that reality has caught up with him now. His once bright eyes now have bags around them. The 25-year-old Kuma is telling the king's army to release the people they kidnapped. The kidnappers say the law has changed. Funny how easily laws can change, despite how unfair those changes can be. Oda really does a good job of capturing just how messed up governments can be. In this case, it was stated that 
Southern people can be quote unquote used however the privileged Northerners want to use them. The current king believes that this will make Sorbet Kingdom prosper. Kuma knows that he's going to make these people who are his neighbors, friends, his followers at the church, slaves. So he gets angry and finally attacks with an Ursus shock. Unfortunately, he doesn't just crush everyone. He and then eventually Ginny and the two former bullies end up in jail for having fought. Even Ginny is beat up, which obviously bothers us, but we can only imagine how much it bothers Kuma as well. It's explained how the Sorbet Kingdom becomes a kind of microcosm of the world government, aka a mini world government, where the Northerners are considered the true Sorbet Kingdom and the South, who is full of people who can't pay the tribute, pretty much lose all their rights and become slaves. But then the hypeness really takes off and delivers on that promise of Dragon's picture earlier. The Freedom Army as it's known at this point appears and attacks Sorbet Kingdom and deposes the corrupt king. Dragon and old friend Ivankov appear. Ivankov says, Hey Kuma, if you're still the same person as back then, let's go and change the world. End quote. Such a hype moment. There's something about just coming and rescuing someone from a prison who's been wrongly accused and just, yeah, it's, it's always a hype moment. And since this is pretty much what Kuma said he wanted, it's not surprising that he joins the army. We're told that the Freedom Army came along with the pirate era and the tragedy of Ohara and was led by the two pillars, Dragon and Ivankov, so Ivankov definitely getting some love here as well. And Kuma gets some love next as we're told that with the addition of Kuma, it transformed into the revolutionary army that reverberated throughout the world. So Kuma was presented as an important missing piece that made the revolutionary army what it is today. Ginny, although this chapter is named after her, isn't presented as that big of a deal for revolutionary army, but we are told she joins revolutionary army too. So here we got Dragon and Ginny, who has similar characteristics to Luffy, at the revolutionary army at the the same time. And as we'll see, they spend quite a bit of time in the Revolutionary Army together. Now yes, it would be weird after all that buildup for Ginny to not be with Kuma, but if Kuma kept saying no to protect her, who knows what might have happened. The math definitely works for Ginny to potentially be Luffy's mother too, and the chapter is named after her as well, showing she is important. Just some food for thought. Back to Dragon, and he says they still lack funds. A big problem for the Revolutionary Army in general. He wants the army to help the rebellion factions of countries who want to depose their kings. He also wants to train new recruits so they know how to fight and handle weapons. Dragon then drops the big bombshell. He was a marine back in the day. It gives us a lot to think about with Garp and everything. He at first followed his father's footsteps, potentially trained under him, but finally decided that he couldn't find justice there in the marines. Kuma says he will follow Dragon and Dragon says he won't make him regret that decision. But something that's going to happen by the end of this chapter may make that sentence a lie. Kuma still goes goes back from time to time to visit his church. Eight more years pass, aka we are 14 years from the present. Gotta say, a young dragon looks very cool, and Ginny is looking better than ever too. Doesn't look like she's aging at all really, and we'll circle back to that. Like Luffy, she's always seen smiling and eating. I believe she's like 37 now, and Luffy would have already been born. By the way, this would explain why she's not in his life too if she were his mother, because she's still helping the revolutionaries with dragon. In fact, she is now the East Army commander. She is very happy because they will be joining with Kuma squad the next day. Then at the Revolutionary Army HQ, someone reports to Dragon that Ginny was kidnapped. The one who reported said there was an unexpected enemy. Oh dear lord, the level of cliffhanger there is crazy. The narrator's note is just disturbing news, end quote. At this point, Dragon looks very grave, lines on his eyes, sweating. You can't picture Dragon looking more devastated. He has his tattoo over his face now. Again, you can say his expression shows how important she was to him and how close they've gotten over the years. But Oda has left the door open for other possibilities and it is possible Dragon would be this devastated for any of his comrades if they were kidnapped. Either way, this chapter did not hurt the Ginny could be Luffy's mom theory, but of course, there is so much Kuma and Ginny shipping that it would be kind of weird, I admit that. Another thing to keep in mind is that in Bonnie's case, her age was never confirmed. It is just estimated to be currently 24, but because of her ability, it's anyone's guess. And the fact that Oda made sure to say it's an estimation in the SPS means it's probably not gonna be that because he could have just given us her age if he wanted to. Since he didn't, 
I'm thinking it will be important to the plot. And I gotta say, I love this chapter for all the dragon info we got. The fact that he was a marine, had a significant history with Ginny, had to deal with her being kidnapped and everything. We already know quite a bit about dragon's powers too. We obviously know that Dragon's got to be strong when we look at his position and who his father and son are. But a big reason his worst criminal in the world bounty has to be ridiculously high in my opinion is because, as Robin pointed out, while pirates usually don't attack the government or navy on their own, Dragon and the revolutionaries directly challenge them. We're told the government is angry and continuously searching for Dragon but to no avail. The fact that Dragon has been able to avoid capture and even continue to act for so long while directly challenging the world government, as we saw in this flashback, shows how much of a threat he truly is and probably hints to his devil fruit as we'll get to. We're further told that he is a man of mystery and no one knows anything about him but thankfully we're starting to learn that now. We do know that he appeared when it looked like Smoker had captured Luffy during chapter 100 and by doing so he helps Luffy escape. When asked why he helped Luffy he simply said what reason would I have to get in the way of another man's voyage. Smoker knew the government was after his head and yet we didn't even see him try to capture Dragon probably knowing that he was outmatched or Dragon's devil fruit as we'll get into made it impossible. Furthermore, after Ivankov saved Luffy and found out that he was Dragon's son, he thought that that would explain Luffy's almost superhuman vitality, another subtle nod to Dragon's strength. We have good clues for speculating about Monkey D Dragon's possible devil fruit as well. There is reason to believe that he has a wind-based Logia fruit or a more generally weather-based power. The wind examples are most obvious. When he steps in to save Luffy from Smoker, there are suddenly huge gusts of wind that spread through the town and even shatter rock. The gusts of wind help Luffy escape. Then, during chapter 587, in a flashback when Luffy and Ace are surrounded by flames, suddenly a path is opened up leading to the revolutionary ship. The too good to be true path could have been easily created with the help of Dragon's powerful gusts of wind. Then during chapter 794 we see Dragon grab Sabo's hand after the latter's shipwreck and then he later appears on his ship being told he is late and we can see what looks like wind coming off of him. The ability to turn into wind and transport using wind explains how he could suddenly swoop in to save Sabo and it would explain why trying to capture him is so difficult if not pointless because he could use his powers to escape from practically every situation. However we've also seen Rain accompany Dragon and specifically it's hard to believe that the lightning that saved Luffy from his execution was a coincidence as well especially since Dragon was present. So rather than a straightforward win Logia fruit there are also theories that he could have a well dragon fruit to match his name. You might think that's too many dragon fruits but even Kaido's dragon fruit is a fish fish fruit so it's definitely still within the realm of possibility. Specifically it could be a mythical zone of a type of eastern dragon called a weather lord. Weather lords are said to control the weather, clouds, and winds and bring life giving rain to the land. That last part sounds especially fitting for a revolutionary. They can also summon a storm when angered and keep in mind it suddenly started raining when Goldie Roger, a dude who loved freedom, was executed and Dragon was present there too. So although it's all a theory, this latter theory could fit more of the strange occurrences we've seen than just a straightforward wind logia fruit. Let me know what you think about the nature of Dragon's Devil Fruit, even though we've seen a lot of its powers. But whatever ends up being the case, I'm sure Oda won't disappoint, especially after keeping Dragon shrouded in mystery for so long. It's good to see him finally giving us more and more about Dragon. Back to the chapter and I can't wait to see what happens next, who the kidnapper was and what exactly happens to Ginny. It would be crazy if Bonnie was Ginny who ended up getting the aging fruit somewhere along the line and Kuma is her father aka pastor since people refer to the leader of a church as father. It would obviously still explain why she cares so much for Kuma since they are still like family but then Bonnie aka Ginny could also be Luffy's mother potentially. Yes I know that's probably way too much of a stretch but that would be a crazy twist, you have to admit. If you enjoyed learning more about the revolutionaries, then you don't want to miss my All Revolutionary Commanders and Their Powers Explained video link on screen right now. Like and subscribe to help us reach our insane goal of 2 million subscribers here on YouTube, and I'll see you in the next one.